I see a completely manipulated market with no good price discovery and it's openly admitted. I mean, that that's the amazing part to me is they can admit it, but people don't see it. So yeah, uh, you know, thinking back to 1986 and I was there on Black Monday, that was when they put in the uh, plunge protection team and they started to manage the market more. Now, a lot of people think that there's all these retail investors, you know, investing in the market, trading and everything like that. And then we've come to find out that countries, central banks, they've been purchasing stocks. I mean, is this true that the retail investor is really not interacting in the market anymore? No, all they're really doing, the retail investor is depositing money into their 401k where maybe they have a, you know, a program with a stockbroker or a financial consultant. But no, they're not heavily in the markets unless it's through a managed money product. And you know, I'm glad that you brought up the governments because I did a study a little while ago on the, the rise of the sovereign wealth funds. And that's really who's been, well, one of the areas that they've really been buying heavily into the market. Uh, Japan, for example, I think, uh, don't hold me to this because I'm obviously not looking at the data, but I'll share that with you, where I believe that in certain stocks, they own 90% of these stocks in the Nikkei. You know, I mean, how is that? a fair price discovery or a retail client. It's not. No, it, it really isn't. And when you look at the stock market and you look at the real economy, now a lot of people think that, you know, the stock market is the economy. And when you, when you look at both, I mean, what do you make of the real economy? When I say the real economy, looking at retail, looking at, you know, uh, what is happening in the housing market, and then you look at the stock market, do you see two separate things happening right now? Well, absolutely. And, and the interesting thing is, is when we transitioned from a gold standard money to a debt standard money and Nixon, when they say they closed the gold window, so it doesn't sound so bad, but what they, what really happened was he handed over the complete power to control inflation to bankers, which no debt and leverage. And so that really, uh, solidified the financialization of all markets and what that means is that over time the globalization but the markets became more important than Main Street and indeed that's the largest part of our economy is what happens in the financial markets so that disconnect really started once the central bankers were in full control of it and it's just gotten to a point now where it's a, it's extreme. When they put the REITs into its own area of the stock market back in September of last year, that was like the very last area that they needed to completely financialize. So we live in a physical world. I mean, the building that you're in, the building that I'm in is physical. And that's the way we've been trained to think about uh, you know, stocks as a corporation that's growing their wealth and you own part of the corporation. But if through financialization, if you go to the SEC website, you can look at any new an IPO, initial public offering. And I can't say that I haven't looked at every single one. So this could be different. But the ones that I've looked at, they don't need the money from the IPO to expand their business and hire people and, and buy new equipment like they used to. They're doing it to connect to the markets so that the early investors can cash out and they can take advantage of the markets in that way. So yeah, it's, we've been trained to think that it represents the economy because at one point it actually did but it does not represent the economy at all anymore. And the, the inflation, which is really a tool for corporations to be able to pay workers less, um, I'll kind of back up to move forward on that. And I would like to, you know, nominal confusion. 
which the central bankers knew and the government understood when they set up the system means that um, nominally, if you had a $20 bill 20 years ago and you have a $20 bill today, nominally they're identical. They're both $20 bills. And that's the way people look at it. But what that $20 bill could buy you 20 years ago and what it can buy you today, we all know because we live through it, it's vastly different. And so wages, the average wage never keeps pace with inflation. Who doesn't know that? Yet the cost of goods and services either meet it or beat it. So the corporations do, their income does keep pace with inflation, but the average worker doesn't. And that's why you have that huge price discrepancy of uh, income inequality. And it's all by design through inflation. But yeah, it, it's a completely different. <laughs> it's a, our training, what we've been taught to believe is no longer true. And it hasn't been true for a while. Now, you, you mentioned inflation and the Fed, as we all know, they've been, you know, monitoring inflation. They've been looking at inflation and they're saying they're seeing no inflation whatsoever. And, you know, through this economy that's deteriorating in many different sectors, they started to raise interest rates and they're talking about unwinding the balance sheet. I mean, is this really the right time for them to do this? And w w actually, why are they doing this? Well, I was I was going to say, you know, they've they've painted themselves into a corner with all of this extraordinary policy that they started in 2008, eight, nine, et cetera. So to unwind that balance sheet, just the runoff from the treasuries, so the interest in the principal repayment funded 40 percent of the deficits last year. So if they stop just reinvesting that, who's going to buy them? Are they going to force pension plans or retirement plans to buy them like they did in Greece before they reset those bonds by 90%? I mean, who's going to pick up that slack? And on the mortgage-backed securities, which they never bought prior to 2009, because that's a derivative, but that goes directly to the banks. You know, they own 24, I think 24 or 25% of that total market. And the last two years, they've bought 30% of every single new issue. So again, just on that runoff of interest in principle, if they don't do that, who's going to pick up that slack? So personally, I don't see how they can. And of course, now everybody else has gone on that bandwagon. You've got Draghi saying it and Abe saying it. You know, these balance sheets are unprecedented. How can they stop buying or what else are they going to create to pick up that slack to make the interest rates stay reasonably stable? Because if they don't, you're going to see a huge spike in interest rates, most likely. And then that is most likely to trigger a derivative event, though it's kind of, you know, hard to find where that trigger interest rate is. So as far as the balance sheet goes, uh, it doesn't make any sense to me for them to have the ability to run it off. But they are clearly committed to raising interest rates. So there's a couple of reasons why I believe that they're doing it. One would be the one that they state, which is so that they can lower them in the next crisis. And since through every crisis, they've lowered them like five and a half times or more, five and a half percent, I should say, or more. Well, the goal is to get up to three and a quarter percent. So if they have to lower them similar to what they've done in the past, then that takes us deeply into negative territory. And looking at Europe, who is already deeply in negative territory, how much deeper do they go in this next crisis? So uh, the other, so that's one part of it. And then the other part of it is 
if banks loan money out, they gather interest and they need, the banks have trading desks. So they need more interest. I mean, this low interest rate environment has killed the pension industry, the insurance industry, the banking, easy profits. Now, not the prop trading. So we're about to see a lot more of that, I'm sure, with deregulation. But, um, you know, they're not raising interest rates for anybody's benefit other, in my opinion, I mean, I can't guarantee this, I'm not sitting around the table with them, but it's about saving those systems or not saving them because that wouldn't, that wouldn't even save them. They're so underwater. Um, maybe, maybe postponing it till the new currency comes in to play till they're ready for the shift. So you mentioned something about pensions, and we, we know yeah. that these low interest rates, the pensions have not been doing well because they've really been based on like something like, what is it, like 5 or 7% type of return? And Yeah, 7.5%. Yeah, 7.5%. Yeah, seven and, seven and, and, and they're really not getting that at all. I mean, and we see Illinois, I mean, they're having a huge amount of trouble. Connecticut having another uh, big problem there. And there are many other states that are having a huge amount of problems. I mean, is this going to be a problem throughout the country, especially for the older generation? I mean, because everyone expects their pension to be there. Right. Well, I think it's already a problem for many since the Teamsters ran out of money on March 1st of this year. And um, in addition to that, there's been a lot of pension cuts. So, and let us not forget Puerto Rico, because that is part of the U.S., and they've defaulted on their geo bonds. So, the answer is absolutely, the money's not there. Uh, the assumptions were ridiculous in the environment that we were in. So, you've got roughly 50% of the investment in the second most overvalued stock market in history. And another big, huge chunk, and so this may be where they pick up the slack in the most expensive bond market in history. And then you've got this growing area of derivatives that are in there or illiquid commercial real estate that's severely overvalued. So, uh, you know, the response was in 2014, they passed a law that allowed the corporation, so now we're talking private as well, because this is just a big issue, period, whether it's public or private, but they allowed the corporations to fund these underfunded pensions even less, and they eliminated the union members' ability to sue if their benefits were cut. They can't sue, they, can't re they have no recourse to recover what they were promised. So the laws are changed to shift that risk more and more onto the you know individual shoulders for sure. Now, you also mentioned just prior a new currency. Now, we've been hearing a lot about new currencies and you've studied patterns, cycles, and there's a lot of people out there saying that, you know, we're, in, we're at the end of this cycle and it's gone on for a very long time. When you see this, when you say a new currency, wh what are you talking about? Well, I'm actually talking about a new money standard and frankly, it hasn't really gone on because, you know, you can't really go by the history books and go, oh, well, all of that is true. Because when you dig a little deeper underneath, we have in this country, uh, even since 1913, that was the beginning of the first money standard shift from a gold-backed money standard to a partially gold-backed and debt-backed money standard, U.S. dollar and gold. But in 71, for those of us that were alive then, and I'm 62, so I certainly remember it, uh, the standard, we were pegged to gold at $35 an ounce. And then all the other countries in the world pegged their currencies to ours because they could convert dollars into gold at $35 an ounce. 
But when we were funding the Vietnam War, we were abusing that privilege and everybody knew it. So there was a run on the dollar via other countries turning in dollars for gold. And in 69, well, you might, you might recall, there were a couple things that happened in 1969. Number one, they took all the large bills out of circulation. So the thousand, the 500, the thousand, the 5,000 and the $10,000 bills gone. They, they didn't demonetize them, but if one came into the banking system, it did not come back out again. So they did not want people to have the ability, uh, this is my opinion, uh, they do not want people to have the ability to hold a lot of wealth in a small package. Though interestingly enough, in I think it was 64, it might have been 65, they actually legalized the American population to own, to have the ability to hold gold certificates again. Though it was definitely not widely, uh, you know, that information was not widely transmitted. Okay, so I think it's, I think there are a lot of things that happened right around that period. However, what also happened since there was a run on the dollar was the International Monetary Fund, the IMF, that was created to oversee the US dollar as the world reserve currency. They knew what was happening, obviously, because all their members are treasury secretaries and central bank heads. And they created the SDR at that time. And it just stands for special drawing rights. And it's just a name like any other name. But um, they, so they put all of the mechanisms in place and, and our treasury secretary actually even went to the global community and said, here, take world reserve currency status back. But instead Kissinger went and created the petrodollar. So all those mechanisms to make that money standard shift transfer at that time were just put to sleep. They weren't dismantled, they were just kind of put to sleep. When the crisis hit in 2008, um, China was actually the first one to say SDR, SDR. So everybody has SDRs, they're allocated, they're given, they're not earned and they are not a claim against anything but they tested all of those mechanisms in 2009 and then in 2011 they brought a template out on how they would shift from a US dollar standard to an SDR standard. So what that really means, that means a couple things. Number one, for the world reserve currency, that means that global assets and instruments are all valued in terms of dollars. Now, I know that's been shifting since 2005, but the dollar is still mostly used in global trade. Well, with the SDR coming in and they have enough votes at the IMF to make this happen as of midnight on December 31st, they, uh, the SDR would be the valuation tool for global instruments and assets. So that means that we, like everybody else had to before us, if they wanted to go outside of their borders to buy anything, they had to do it with dollars. So they would have to convert their currency into our currency and then they could go buy stuff. Well, once this shift happens, we will have to buy the SDRs in order to buy stuff globally. Right now, we can just create them from debt. But that also means that all of the other uh, countries that are holding all of these dollars, well, now they don't need those dollars. So the money standard that currently, you know, that we currently supply all of those dollars will come back to us and they'll do it through the SDR substitution fund. It's called the substitution fund. So if you're holding dollar denominated instruments or dollars or what have you, you simply deposit them into it. They'll wash them, they'll shift it into SDR denominated. I mean, that's a button push. It's not like it requires much effort or work and all of a sudden, all those excess dollars come back. So we need a reset on the debt 
because the debt is so high that most of the income just goes to paying interest on the debt, not touching principal, and that keeps compounding. And the new standard will be the SDR, and I believe that it will be a blockchain technology with what's called a smart contract overlay, which is a self-executing contract uh, that will be, if they have their druthers, controlled by the IMF. I think we'll have dollar coin or fed coin or but pretty much probably dollar coin here so people don't think that the dollar has changed which is how they executed in 1913 and again you know how they did it in 1971 they just kept the name the same and people don't realize that anything has changed when everything has changed so l let me just get this straight so the sdr that is at a much higher level because the everyday person is not going to have an SDR. Correct. That That is for governments and central banks around the world. And corporations. And, and, and corporations. And you're saying that for the everyday person, I'll just talk about the U.S. right now. Yes. We're going to have some type of, I guess, cryptocurrency. The paper dollar will no longer exist. If they have their druthers, Larry Summers says, get rid of the $20 bill, too. Yeah, well, he is not my favorite person. All so, right. so, so let me ask you. So, the transition from all those people that have, you know, their bank accounts, their pensions, um, their investments, uh, they have all their money, you know, in the banks, in the system. Now, this is all dollars today. When this goes through this transition, what happens to that? Do they get the same exact back? Or does something change? Because no longer is the dollar the reserve currency of the world at this point. So what happens to that? Well, that goes back to when the dollar resets, everything resets. And the reset is the way that a government declares bankruptcy. So for you and I, you know, if we are completely over our head in debt and we need to get out of it, then it's not so easy anymore, but you can go and declare bankruptcy and have those debts wiped away. But a government cannot really easily do that, particularly when they have a predominant currency. So the choice that they make, which is the way that they declare bankruptcy, is by completely devaluing the currency. So anything that is created from dollars pays you out in dollars or pays you back in dollars when the dollar has no value because there's no confidence left in it then those things have no value either a trillion times zero is still zero and that's the piece that's that nominal confusion right because you think you have a million dollars but if you go ahead and look at what that million dollars bought you in 1971 where that was a lot of money. The average income was like 9,500 bucks and a family of four could live on that with one income. Okay. Today, I think the average income is something like 52 or 53,000. So nominally, wow, 9,500, 53,000. But can a family of four live reasonably well on $53,000 a year? Exactly. That's what happens to all of the that wealth. It gets reset. It has no value. So the, the people that have been saving, I, I just want to make this clear to everyone. I mean, the people that have been saving, they've been putting money away, whatever money they have today, their pensions. You're saying that's going to drop to zero. Mm -hmm. Or, or some, somewhere, wherever that reset is, I don't know exactly what that level is going to be. But like in Russia, 98, it was 1,000 to 1. And 1,000 to 1 seems to be kind of standard. So, okay. so yeah, so this is going to, I mean, from your, from your viewpoint, I mean, how are they going to spin this? How are they going to convince the people that this is okay? Because a lot of people are going to say, well, wait a minute, I'm losing all of this? This doesn't make any sense to me. Well, you know, once it happens, what, think about 2008. 
What recourse did you have when the markets imploded? And always, always, when there is a money standard shift, there's a tremendous amount of chaos around it to, to distract you from what's really happening. You know, at 71, we had the Vietnam War, we had the protesters. My sister was Billy Clubbed at Kent State. Um, we had civil rights, we had women's lib, we had the oil embargo, the stock market imploded 45%. We were running at 37% inflation. And, and let me just make a point here. The only difference between hyperinflation and regular inflation is the speed of the inflation. So the more money they print, the more debt they take on, the more, you know, the more money that's in the system, well, what's been, what's been inflating? Stocks, bonds, real estate, because those derivatives are based upon the price action of the underlying. That's where the real growth in the markets have come, in the derivatives. And those are just big bets. So what happens to any wealth that's held in the system? The banking system is insolvent. It's insolvent. We, we don't know the value at risk in the derivatives. We know it's at least 1.7 quadrillion, which is what, roughly 2,200 times the global economy? How do you bail that out? Or bail that in even? So, uh, I mean, during this period, are, are banks going to be shut down? Are, are banks still going to be open? Will people be able to get any funds out? Will they be? Able, will anyone be able to do anything at this point? Or are they just going to say, listen, we need to shut it down right now. You can't access anything until we let you know. I think that they want us to go into cyberspace. So, yes, I do think that there's going to be a bank holiday. And so I do think that everybody, e even though there is definitely a war on cash going on, I think that everybody needs to have a certain level of cash completely outside of the system in their possession. Yes, you're going to lose purchasing power. Yes, it's going to go to zero. But people don't understand this at this point. So that's like your first line of defense. They likely will give you minimum access to the cash in the ATM. I mean, you can look at Greece or you can look at Argentina and, and get a sense of what that looks like, but it won't be enough. Maybe it'll be 70 bucks a day. Maybe it'll be 300 bucks a day, but I'm guessing just because they really want us to get used to no, no cash and then they that have full control of everything in cyberspace, that and they did this in Greece too because they wanted to encourage people to use the digital money. Um, we may still be able to to pay our bills digitally, and then people will get more comfortable with that and get suckered in. But but here's the thing about that. Okay, if you if you read the central bank documentation in the current system. There's about an 18 month lag time from the time that they make a, a policy decision till whether or not they know that they actually got the results that they were looking for. When everything is digital, that gives them immediate uh, understanding of the policy decision. That also removes any limitations of going below zero. Okay. Now it's, that's being tested in Europe, but they could push a button and if they want you to spend, if you saw your principal going down in the bank and you couldn't preserve your principal at least in cash, what are you going to do? You're going to buy anything that you can to try and hold that principal. Well, that's hyperinflation, isn't it? That's what yes. people say, hyperinflation. So how does gold and silver fit into this? Because a lot of people here in the U.S., they do not hold gold. They do not hold silver. I mean, yeah, do they have jewelry and things like that, but not the actual, you know, blocks or coins of gold and silver. And for a very long time, uh, as long as I can remember, gold and silver has never been taught to be anything except, you know, for jewelry. So a lot of right. people don't even think about it. 
And right. going throughout this whole entire time period, especially since 2008 moving forward, we've seen these smashdowns of gold and silver. I mean, yeah. if the dollar is losing value, I mean, the dollar is going down and that gold and silver, the precious metals market, is going down at pretty much the same rate. I mean, it makes no sense, really. Correct. N nothing in these markets makes sense because nothing is real. But let me back up a little bit on the physical gold and silver because originally, I mean, why do we even have money? And this is not taught in any of the schools, and it should be. True. And I may do something about that at some point here when I have a minute. But, um, you know, originally you were working and if you didn't need what your neighbor was producing or you had plenty, then you still needed a way to value and store your labor. So they tried lots of things over the years, but only gold meets all the criteria to be a good money. Plus it's labor based. So when we're on a gold standard that puts restrictions around the government, but when what you're actually doing is trading your labor for someone else's labor. Oh my, isn't that fair? But that didn't work for governments or corporations because governments wanted to have the ability of uh, to have the ability to tax you more without going through legislation and corporations wanted you to be willing to work for less. If, if anybody wants this, if you just look at the way they set up the system, you see that. So when they started that transition, they knew in 1913, they knew immediately after, uh, after they legalized the Federal Reserve, they authorized them to print like two and a half times almost the amount of money in circulation. So everybody lost about 50% of their purchasing power, but they didn't want people to complain kind of like what you're talking about. So they left the barter ratio and the convertibility, the ability for the average citizen to convert into gold. So the average income because of that barter ability piece, everybody's income, uh, the average income I should say, more than tripled. Well, if your costs double, but your income triples, do you really care that your costs double? No. So they, it was still called the dollar, even though it was now backed only, you know, a 20th of an ounce used to back a dollar. Now it backs $2 and 40 cents, but nobody complained. And there you have the roaring twenties. Happy days are here again. And we're off to the races. And then they use 33 to justify it. But, Going forward with that, now we're on a partial gold debt standard. Okay, well, the Vietnam War, we stretched that. We wanted to be able to tax and spend more. The system was breaking down. So where we were now trading our labor for government debt and partial gold, how we traded in after 71, after August of 71, we're trading our labor for government debt that we are obligated to repay. I mean, stop and think about the logic of that. So they created these mechanisms at that point to make you think that gold had no value. They didn't want you to hold your purchasing power or your wealth. And they created the spot market to dwarf the physical market and they actually say it in their documentation so that we can manage the perception of how people think about gold. And I've got some great quotes from FOMC meeting minutes from Alan Greenspan, who you know knew that gold and economic freedom were hand in hand when he became part of the Fed. He forgot all that, but now he's remembered it again. You know, kind of interesting, but they know that gold and gold particularly and silver too is in our DNA and what it does what it was created to do is to hold your wealth even over time so the importance of gold and silver is the same importance level that it had way back when they first decided that this is the best tool for that job it still is and it is the only thing that you can hold outside of the system to preserve your choices 
as well as your wealth. And because it has been so artificially suppressed, because they don't want you, I mean, think about this. I'm going to do something later today on this. But North Korea just launched a missile that can hit the U.S. And gold went down. And if you look at every major occurrence that people might not be looking at, like when China entered the SDR basket, they hammered gold because they do not want you running to the safety of gold. If you're going to, do paper gold. But they want you away from gold because that is how they get to transfer your wealth. Physical gold and silver in your possession will protect you. And if you look at what the smartest guys in the room are doing for themselves, central banks, although apparently not here, but everywhere else in the world, are massively accumulating asset protection gold. And the 1% are massively accum accumulating very high-end collectible coins, and you can see it in the rarity index. So, you know, oh, I think you should always do what the guys, the smartest guys in the room do for themselves. So, 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 we, yeah. have, so we have governments... Uh, different countries, I should say, protecting themselves with precious metal. They we have, have we have the wealthy also, like you just said, protecting themselves. But they don't do this out in the open, saying, you know, I'm going to buy all of this. They what do they do it very very quietly so no one realizes what's happening? Yes, and th and that goes back to the patterns. Okay, so you know where you are in the trend cycle. But not only do they do it very quietly, and you can see those accumulation patterns, they actually turn around and want you to think that whatever it is, is horrible, right? Don't buy gold. Why would you want to buy gold? I mean, ooh, you have to store it. Ooh, you have to protect it. Oh, yeah, really? Let me put all my wealth in the hen house with the foxes watching because that's so much safer. Is it more convenient? It is as long as the system works. It is not when the system does not work. The value of gold and silver right now, I mean, they smash it down so low. I mean, silver, I mean, what are we at? $16 or whatever it is, gold, 12. I mean, from, have you ever, have you done any type of calculation of where you think gold and silver should be right now or where it's going to go? Yes, and, and um, there's a little bit of nuance on this, but I use it for every single asset class, okay? And I call this the fundamental value, the true value of any asset, and it's based upon the single most important function of that asset or that instrument for its creators, okay? Not what you and I want it to do, that's not relevant, but why was it created? And then how has history valued that function? So for gold, its most important function is to hold your assets even. For dollars, its most important function, and this is according to the guys that created this, Keynesian economics, um, its most important function is inflation, which erodes value. So that's two sides of that coin. Well, how is money created in the current system via debt? Since most countries no longer publish how much new money they're doing, we can use the debt as a proxy for how much money is out there. When they do the reset, there's only one way, and they've done it the same way over 6,000 years, over 4,800 times, even currently, so that's pretty easy. There's a finite amount of gold. So what I do, and I'm not trying to get us to the penny, I'm just trying to get us in the vicinity because nobody knows what that cover ratio is going to be or how much debt they will have grown at that point. But at this point, it's somewhere in the vicinity of $9,000 an ounce. And for silver, it's somewhere in the vicinity of $600 for per ounce. And that's its true value. So at, you know, wherever silver is, 15, 16 bucks an ounce and gold, 12, 10, or wherever that happens to be at the moment, it's a flippant bargain, which is why you see everybody in the know accumulating when it's cheap. 
when we enter this reset, what is gold and silver going to do? Are they still going to suppress it or is gold and silver going to break out at that time? Well, actually, they need it to go to fundamental value to reset all of that debt. So it actually, and this, this happens all the time, I can send you tons of charts on this, I mean that's easy enough to find, that gold rises in terms of that fiat. See, see part of your question, and, and this is our training, is that we put value in dollars, but dollars have no intrinsic value. You can't that eat is true. them. That is true. Right? And they're only used in one place, Whereas gold and silver are used in manufacturing, they're used in the financial area, they're used in jewelry, they're actually even used in food. So they're used across the entire spectrum of the global economy in every single area, period, end of discussion. So they always have value anyway, because there's always a market for them in terms of dollars, maybe it's less or maybe it's more. But it doesn't matter, there's always demand. And the true the same is not true for fiat money. There are lots of fiat currencies that do not exist anymore. E even in this country, the, the silver certificates and the gold certificates, they've been demonetized, right? So you can't use them. So we don't realize this, but yeah, that is actually what they need to happen. They need gold to rise somewhere near its fundamental value to conclude the reset. It's how it's done. It's how it's done. So that's easy. So do you think China and Russia know this because they've been accumulating a lot of gold over time? So is India and many other countries. Not you really you really don't hear much about the US accumulating gold no, at no. all. So mm -hmm. you think they understand that this is coming? I think they all understand that this is coming. I think 100% of them understand that this is coming. That's why they've gotten the SDR in place. And once they saw, I mean, they used to poo-poo the blockchain technology. Bitcoin only came out in 2009. It's, it's new technology. Um, but now they're embracing it. Now they're going, huh, we can see how this could be really used as a centralized mechanism. And if everybody's comfortable being in cyberspace, we have 100% control over every choice they make and they have completely dehumanized the process, which is, I don't know about completely, but they have significantly um, put walls between I mean, the, whole, the whole part of technology. People don't really communicate the way they once did, you know, and so that, that helps the central banks. But yes, I'm 100% uh, certain they know this. It's planned. And they, they gave us a roadmap. Yeah, they all know. They all know. I mean, can this reset? I mean, we're talking about a collapse of one system and the birth of a new system. Correct. Can this be stopped? I mean, yeah. can, can it be stopped in any way? I mean, Trump is, you know, he's talking about bringing back manufacturing, bringing, I mean, none of this has really happened. It's great for press, but nothing has really happened. Can this be stopped or is he there to say, okay, this is what's going to happen and I know it's going to happen? Because before he became president, he said, you know, the stock market's in a bubble. After he was president, he said the economy is a mess. So he kind of knows that, you know, he's a businessman. He knows what's going on in the economy. It's not like he's in the dark here. He, I mean, most of the people know what's going on. So is he trying to stop this or is he saying uh, there's nothing I can do and it's going to happen no matter what? Yeah, well, for one thing, you know, we have to reset the debt because the whole system's based on compounding debt and we reached the ability for debt to stimulate our economy in 97. So then they created all that leverage. So yeah, I, I'm 100% certain that everybody in power understands that everything must reset. I think the discussion on bringing manufacturing home and all of that is, is um, if that actually happens will be a good thing because we're going to need to restart our economy. And if we have no jobs or all the jobs are in restaurants, you know, which is what I see here in Phoenix, an awful lot of restaurants going in, which is amazing to me, 
then we have some problems. So I really, I'm, yeah, I mean, I'm, look, there are 196 countries in the world and 189 of them are members of the IMF. And all of the members of the IMF are either treasury secretaries or, and, and the central bank chiefs. So do I think that all of the governments understand what they're doing to the currencies? Absolutely, it was by design. How do they not know? And we can't stop it because if you put a component of gold in the currency to kind of stop the bleeding, well, how are you going to service that debt? I mean, I did this study, I, I don't know, seven or eight years ago. I'll have to go back and look at the date. I don't really remember when I did it. But I was looking at the deficits and I said, gee, if we're only running, and I say only tongue in cheek, but if we're running, you know, a trillion dollar deficit, why are we servicing 20 trillion or whatever it is in debt? So that doesn't quite make sense. So I dug into all of the spreadsheets and what I ended up discovering is that 77% of the debt that we were currently servicing at that time was compounding interest. So how can we stop this? Even if we stopped every bit of spending, we're still the debt's still going to grow. It has to reset. And yes, they know it. Yes, they know. That's why they put everything in place and the and the new bankruptcy laws and you know and all sorts of mechanisms are in place for this reset. And it's there. For my last question, Lynette, what would you tell people? What would you tell them to get prepared for what's about to happen here? This reset. What would you tell them to do? Well, there are a few things. Number one, on a personal level, food, water, energy, security, barterability, and wealth preservation. Barterability is any talent or anything physical that you possess. So I have chickens. Okay, I can barter with my eggs. You know, I've created an urban farm. Never in my wildest dreams did I think I was going to be a farmer at, you know, 50 and 60 years old. And yet here I am. I've created a farm on my little, you know, and I'm right in the middle of the city because of my daughters. And that's a whole other story. But you want to make sure that you can be as independent as possible inside of this mess. And so it's silver for barterability and gold for wealth preservation. There's some nuances with that. Uh, but then in addition to that, you want to create a community. So for example, you know, we're, part of what we're doing right here is definitely creating a community because we can't stop this, but we might just have a shot at going back to, I don't know, let's say a constitutional currency at the end of this. So if enough of us are aware of what's happening, then we might have some choices. Okay. If we don't, if we just stay as individuals, then we have no power, but there are definitely more of us than there are of them. If we, if enough people understand what's going on and can say, Oh no, that's not okay with me. So those are the things, food, water, energy, security, barterability, wealth preservation, and community is what we all need to be doing. Lynette, thank you very much for being on the X-22 Report Spotlight. I really do appreciate it. Once again, how can people see all your work? Well, we have our own YouTube channel, and uh, so we work on that every week. It's YouTube ITM Trading, and of course, they can always give us a call. Can I give our phone number? Absolutely. Okay, 888-696-4653, and um, I think when they call in, they will understand that we're a different kind of gold company because we treat people the way we would want to be treated, and we want to understand you so that we can really make the best recommendations for you. And, and we really don't care whether you're big or you're small, you know, you have a lot of wealth at this moment or you don't. We think everybody needs to be in position to survive this mess. It's not going to be pretty.